Hi, welcome to Power Breakfast Singapore 10. Okay, this is a session presented by uh, Matt Hitchcock, PowerShell MVP, lead for Singapore PowerShell user group, all about Microsoft Azure Remote App. Along in this call is myself, Milton Go, and Ben. So sorry that this is a, a post-recorded uh, introduction video. Uh, this video is supposed to be out in the uh, out sometime in April uh, due to some delay. So uh, on a positive note, uh, the Singapore PowerShell user group is really happy uh, to be able to host the PowerShell conference Asia 2015. Okay, this is the first ever two days conference all about PowerShell. So the registration is right now open. Do hurry up uh, and register at uh, PSCon Asia 2015.eventbrite.sg. So some of the highlight of this event is that um, so the platinum sponsor is Sapien, the gold sponsor is Microsoft Asia, and we have speakers uh, coming all around the world. And what best is that you can, we have PowerShell product team uh, members uh, flying in, and you are able to talk to them face to face. Jeffrey Snowden, the inventor of Windows PowerShell, will be giving us a kickstart over Skype for Business. Thank you. Welcome um, to this Power Breakfast presentation today is going to be talking about Azure Remote App. Um, my name is Matt Hitchcock. I am a consultant. Um, I'm currently working as a contractor for MCS. I'm a two-year PowerShell MVP as well, so at the moment I've kind of got the, uh, the best of, uh, of uh, both worlds. Um, Primarily, I've always kind of been working more kind of around uh, Active Directory and I identity management. Um, over the last year, though, I've kind of um, uh, dabbled a little more in other areas, things like office, enterprise, mobility, um, a little private cloud, and now I'm, I'm doing a nice amount of work with Azure. And that's actually how I kind of came across um, uh, Azure Remote App. So I actually had the opportunity to work on this as a project towards the end of last year, um, which is when Azure Remote App actually went um, GA. So it was available, I'm pretty sure it was around... November last year, and about a month later, we were working on a proof of concept implementation uh, for an organization um, that have more than one million users of their application. So their use case at the time was uh, they have this web application which is used uh, by a heck of a lot of people. And so a problem that they have is that every time they want to make a change to the application, because it's web, they've got a lot that they need to test. They need to make sure every change works with every browser, and not only every browser type, every browser version, all the way back to um, probably the oldest one which people could be using, which is a pretty early version of IE. So they have a really kind of high overhead in terms of, of application changes, and their use case was if they can move it into remote app, it means that they now only need to code the application for one, um, one uh, browser. Um, which they control. They'll control the version, they'll control the patch level. All that will need to happen is that the users will need to get the remote app client, uh, log in, open the application, and, and, uh, and they're away. So that was the original uh, requirement that we had. Um, during uh, the project actually, it turned a little more complex because they needed to have a lot of, of automation around user management, around how they manage the images. Um, and when 
the product initially came out, there wasn't too much available. So the commandlets hadn't actually been released yet. So we had to work with a kind of internal pre-release version of the commandlets. Um, there was no SDK either. So trying to do um, uh, any kind of automation with Azure web jobs wasn't really an option either. So we had some interesting scenarios to, to work around and I'll talk about those a little more towards the end. So my objective for this is to share with you a little bit about what Azure uh, Remote App is um, and then to help you uh, have a look at what we can automate um, and where there are some areas which could potentially need some improvement over time. Um, I, I'm aware that I've got some people watching this who, who actually coded the commandlets I plan to talk about, so I'll be as nice as, as, uh, as I can comment-wise. Um, so important to point out as well, um, I have only really worked with Azure Remote App a little bit and, and on one project, so I don't know the whole lot. Um, I plan to share with you what I do know um, and hopefully you'll have enough, uh, enough uh, information to go off and kind of um, fill out the rest on your own. So a little bit of a quick overview about what Azure Remote App is. If you've ever used Citrix or if you've ever used anything like RDS or Terminal Server, um, it's pretty much the same concept but without the overhead of all, all the kind of on-premise um, implementation and server maintenance. Uh, basically, you create um, a VHD image which, which contains your applications for people to use. You would upload that into the Azure Remote App Portal and then you can make those applications available. Azure will run your, uh, your image um, and it will share your applications out to your remote app clients. So the way you would normally create your image is you would kind of create uh, your new VM, you would load it with all the applications that you want, run a sysprep, and then upload uh, uh, the VHD to the portal. From there, once you're in, you can create a, a collection, which is actually sharing out a collection of, of applications which are in, in the image, assign those to your users and then, um, and then you're away. So there are two deployment types you can use. There's a cloud only one, which is pretty much what I talked about then. You will create your own image, upload that, um, it, it has no reference or no link into your internal um, IT or onto your networks, into your AD. It just runs as its own standalone image um, and that's actually the one I've worked with. There's also another option which is a hybrid deployment. This is where um, it it runs more like an internal application server. So you'll create a virtual network. Your virtual network will have a VPN into your on-premise network. And, and uh, your traffic kind of goes more through an, an internal route rather than over the internet. Um, I think as well, you can also then connect the image into your active directory. Um, I'm a little hazy on that, so I would need to check uh, uh, the TechNet uh, documentation. But that's kind of a rough overview of how it works. And the, the intention is that 
you can then make any application available on any uh, device anywhere. So a really, uh, a really good use case for this as well, actually, is if you're if you're creating applications, if you're an application developer, and you want to have people kind of trying your code, at the same time you want to keep it very controlled and not have to release a version of your code which is uh, then uh, potentially kind of un, un uh, maintained. Um, it will help you there. Um, also, if you want to release an, an application and you're not sure how many people might use it, this is a good way to kind of collect um, collect information about that because not only would you need to assign the application to the people that you want to use it so that uh, they can, so they would need to request it, but it also collects some pretty helpful usage information as well. So you can kind of tell um, how often your application is used, and that might help you work out, am I working on, on uh, a project that's actually worth uh, uh, continuing on with? So those are really the use cases and the overview. Um, Sorry, Matt, can I just yeah. ask a couple of questions on that? Um, yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah. Just on what you went through there. So. Um, first of all, just just around building the the server image and and how you go about that. Do, does does that image need to know anything? Like, does it need to know that it's going to be deployed to remote app? Do you need to install special roles or anything like that, or is that completely transparent to that image itself? And and Azure is managing that delivery. There, there is nothing that you need to do at all. That is all taken care of. Uh, by Azure. So when you upload, when you upload your image, um, which is actually uh, sys prepped anyway, yep. when that is actually booted up, Azure takes care of everything. Okay, so, that's nice. Yeah, yeah. So really, all you need to do is create your image and then add your applications. Um, and then the rest is all handled. Um, where it runs as an image as well, the way you would maintain it is very much like you would a normal OS image. So even though it's kind of running like a VM, it's not a VM you would manage like a VM kind of thing. So you wouldn't need to worry about like uh, uh, backup, patching, all of that. You would, of course, yeah. um, need to run uh, kind of periodic image maintenance. So you would actually patch your image. You would apply new versions of applications into the image. But that's normally easier to do than actually maintaining a VM, right? Yeah, you do. It's not. It's not running in the background the whole time. You just maintaining that static image as, as you update, like just any other file or kind of with your, yeah. your application. So, and basically to, to push this down, so um, this is essentially publishing the application um, as a, basically a remote desktop session, right? So everything, there's no real code running on the device. It's, it's just the output, right? And, and input to exactly virtualize right. that. So, so that does that require a special client on the device? It requires it this running? client. Yes. Okay. Um, it requires the Azure Remote App client, which is available for Windows 8.1, Mac OS, um, iOS, Windows Mobile, um, Android, pretty much every major uh, device. So. For the project I worked on, um, this was actually one of the main reasons that they wanted to use it. They have users who are using every every platform, right? Yeah, so, every possible um, combination. Yeah. yeah. So 
it means whether a user's on Mac OS um, or, or iPad, you know, anything, they can use it. This application is available either for a download directly from, um, I think it's remote.azure.com, something like that. I would need to check. Um, there's a I'm link. I'm just checking the Google Play the, Store uh, now on my phone. Yeah, yeah. So there is a um, there is an application there. You'll be able to download that. And then for any applications which are shared with you, uh, you can launch those on that on that uh, device. And okay, so that was my kind of last question that I had was, is there is there a, a use case here for publishing public apps? So so apps where you want to you know push something out where anyone can um, can access that without specific permissions. Is that something that's available now, or, um, or so, you, you need to individually assign specific accounts through some kind of directory system? So I would imagine that it's not a use case for a public app, and the reason for that is one that it needs licensing. So you need to okay. allocate a license to everybody who's using it. Um, mm -hmm. Well, you have a kind of allocated license uh, uh, pool that you're yeah, actually. But there's like a for. cow, cow yeah, model yeah. somewhere in there, right? Okay. Um, and and then as well, you need to make sure that that you're providing enough resources to your image so that it can run well for the number of users that you need. So you need to make sure you're kind of always on top. Of um, of uh, capacity planning, so okay. If it, so there's not like a at, at this stage anyway. There's not an automated scaling of that. Well, let me take you through the portal, and okay. we'll I'll shut up and let you continue. I just sorry. <laughs> I just wanted to understand a bit more about about the deployment stage. It was good. No, things. no, no. Uh, that's fine. Um, it's uh, I like it when there's more interaction rather than just me trying to talk um, for a whole hour. So that's uh, much, much uh, appreciated, actually. So let's have a quick look through the remote app portal then. So um, if you go to uh, your, your, your uh, remote app within the portal, uh, you've got your three tabs, and there are some terminology to know here. So uh, your template images are the images that you'll run, um, which will contain your applications. You can upload your own images here. I don't have any images uploaded already of my own. The ones I'm using today are two from, from the... Uh, the gallery. Um, so I think that's it in collections. Yeah. So in collections, this is where you would actually create your your collection to provide to your users. So this is uh, basically uh, you're choosing which image you want to use, and then from there you'll choose which applications you want to share out. So had you uploaded any images, it would have appeared in here um, to choose. There are some options around plans, and this is how your license, whereabouts you actually want your, uh, your uh, uh, remote app to be running, um, and then a name, and it's pretty simple from there. Your virtual networks um, relate to where you want to have a hybrid running. So this is where you'll create a virtual network, your collection will appear internally, that network is then VPNed into your on-premise on, uh, environment. Um, Within the collections I've got at the moment, which is only one, uh, 
you can of course manage your user access um, through the portal you can sort of import a list of users to assign to a collection um, I probably want to remove that account because I want to add that later um, the let's give that a minute the applications which are available for the collection appear here and these are not the applications which are in the image these are the applications that you've actually shared out um, and we'll look at that a little later as well so within the image I have now I can share out these applications um, session management this is where we had a problem um, with our our particular project and and I'll talk about that a little more um, when we're looking at code and then with the scale I think this is what you're interested in um, where you can kind of allocate how many users you would have per collection um, I'm not sure what the upper limit is um, there is some really good information on TechNet, though, um, so I would uh, have have to refer you to that. Okay. So that's an overview of how it actually works in the portal and what you can manage. Um, so let's have a look at how we can actually do this with uh, PowerShell as well. Just trying to kill off a few things. Hey man. Uh, yep. I sorry, just sidetrack a little. Is there any hard limit on the size of the application that you can share? Um, what do you mean in terms of? Yeah. Um, I mean when you have a remote app, right? So it will pull your server to to render the application, right? Yeah. <clears throat> so. Uh, is there any restriction in terms of the size? Like um, now we, we see you have calculator. Um, is is there any, what other use case are there? Like people loading um, what other productivity tool? What's the common common uh, business tool that is being shared across uh, enterprise or yeah? Okay, um, so I'm not actually sure what the limits are. However, you can use this to share. Uh, pretty much any application which is which will work well on terminal services. Okay. Um, so anything like Office, any kind of applications like that uh, mm -hmm. are going to be fine. Um, I've I've heard talk as well of of people. Um, using this for one tier of a multi-tier application also. I see. So it is pretty flexible in terms of what you can use. I'm not sure what the the upper limits are. I guess um, uh, you would need to use your capacity planning information to kind of work out how many users to have per collection and if you're running into problems maybe kind of look at having like multiple uh, 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 collections offering s s s similar applications kind of thing okay yeah you probably want to mostly use it for like the presentation layer right where you yeah. you've got the back end systems grinding away somewhere else and you just mm -hmm. use it you're just pushing out the the front end exactly right yeah Okay. Yeah. Okay. So I mentioned earlier on I wanted to run all of this via Ice Pack, but um, that's not actually working for me at the moment. So I'll just run through each each command uh, that I've kind of pre-typed out. Um, I don't really do well typing and talking, so if if I write all the code ahead of time it actually helps me out quite a lot so um, 
So I mentioned earlier on that the the remote app product became generally available towards the end of last year, and at that time, the commandlets weren't quite released yet. So when I was working with it originally, we um, we were using internal versions. Um, they look mostly like the ones which are out now, but not entirely. And the module in which these commandlets initially appeared were in a recent Azure release which came out um, in either March or early April. It was this uh, release version here. So um, you'll need to have that module. Um, I haven't actually... I won't... Uh, I won't go into how to do that too much. Uh, it is available on this URL and Trevor actually covers how to get and how to load the Azure um, commandlets in his uh, uh, Power Breakfast presentation as well. So I'll refer you to those uh, for the commandlets. But this is uh, the module you'll need where it initially appeared. So if we have a look at what is available to manage, it's pretty much everything that we saw in the portal. So there's a lot there. Um, so we can manage our users, sessions, uh, our collections. We've got some uh, reporting around collection usage, um, app locations, the licensing um, programs, images and templates, and then all of these ones towards the end are more around where you're creating a hybrid model and having um, uh, to manage virtual networks as well. So I've not actually played around uh, with these ones. It's more the ones at the top. So Here's the problem that I sort of have at the moment with not just these commandlets, the Azure module as a whole. Um, the problem is that that for me as an MVP and a person who kind of works a lot with with uh, people in in the community, kind of teaching them how to pick up and how to learn um, PowerShell. One of the main things that we talk about is learning how to use help. And help is, is actually one of the main things that sets this apart from every other automation language out there. The help in PowerShell is incredible, but the problem is it's only ever as as uh, good as its weakest component. And from what I've seen at the moment, that is unfortunately the Azure module. So if we take a look at some of the help topics around a few commandlets, um, we're going to get a lot of kind of empty information. So, you know, this lists the locations supported. It's like, okay, but what's a location? Um, it, it's not really kind of help. You can kind of pick up with zero knowledge and, and work out what is actually going on. So if we look at another one for remote app program, this one is okay. It has examples in there. Um, not really... Uh, you can work out from the example what it has actually done, but there's not really much to tell you clearly what's happening. Um, again, there's no input help, output help. Um, to pick on a couple more, uh, workspace, um, if we take a look at that, that's okay, that's usable if you know 
what it is. If you're not sure what this is, then you're not really sure how to use it. Um, so, again, this isn't only a problem with these particular commandlets, it's a problem across the whole Azure um, module. And it's a problem because if you're new and if you're just actually picking this up and you hear uh, and you hear the help is really good and really easy to use, if this is your initial impression of it, then it may not be quite accurate. Um, so yeah, I would really offer those comments. And I'll touch a little more on some other examples later on. I guess so, just keep running update help, right? And, and hope that can <laughs> push down pretty right, soon. Okay. I'm sure it will. OK, so if we do, actually, you reminded me of uh, uh, another problem. Uh, oops. You reminded me of another problem I nearly moved on from, so thank you for that, Ben. But if you run update help module for Azure, there's no update help module for Azure. <laughs> OK, that's a massive fail there. So, <laughs> yeah, so, so the other thing there is um, if you also think, well, that's OK. I don't need to download it. I can just go online, right? Wrong. Can't go okay. Online either. Yeah. So, okay. They they do need to work on that then. Yeah, yeah. I just wanted to highlight it because um, uh, it it's, it's not indicative of the general PowerShell help. Yes, system. it it is an area that is in much need of improvement. And if this is your initial impression of using help, um, try not to draw a conclusion from this module. <laughs> um, that's probably how <laughs> I would like to put it for now. OK, <laughs> so um, if you know what you actually want to manage and how you want to do it, you're well away. So we mentioned uh, uh, we, we do have all these areas we can manage. Um, it's in in terms of management coverage. Um, the commandlets actually cover it pretty well. Uh, there's a lot which we can automate here that we would manually need to do within the uh, uh, the portal. So coverage-wise, it's pretty good. So let's have a look at the the templates uh, we've got. So if I have a look at uh, the VM images available, um, or the images available for me, um, I haven't uploaded any of my own images at the moment. So the two I have are the image from, from the Azure Gallery 2012 R2, and also the Office trial image as well, and that's um, I'll work a little bit with that for this uh, um, demo. So we can automate the creation of a new collection. Um, all I need to know is which image I want to use, and that's uh, the one I'm highlighting here. Uh, give it a name, my licensing plan, the location I want to put it into, which will be Southeast Asia, and then I'm away. I can just uh, run and create that. Oh, no, I can't. I need to log in to Azure first. Bear with me. <clears throat> okay, so logged into Azure. So now 
I can hopefully create my new collection. Yep, so we're off and away and we should see that one coming up in the portal pretty soon. There might be a slight delay, but um, we can move on because we we know it's happening anyway. So, so once I have that collection, um, I'll actually work with a collection I created earlier, um, rather than waiting for that one. Uh, we can have a look at the applications which are on the start menu of the template that we're using quite easily. So there's a pre-written command for that. So you can tell here I've got PowerShell ISE, PowerShell, Paint, uh, Media Player, Internet Explorer. If you had a case where you wanted to make every application within the image available, that's fairly easy to do. You would need to um, to run a query for those applications on, on the collection that you want to use and then uh, for each you can just publish each application um, and make that available. So if we run this one switch to the portal and, and have a look at our server image, we should notice applications um, begin popping up. So you can automate the pretty much up to now, we can automate the whole thing. We can upload images, we can look for programs within the image, we can then publish and make those available. Um, yeah, so we're pretty good so far. So once I have my applications up, um, you can query for the applications. Um, and you can either query uh, a particular collection name, so if I know which collection name I want to have a look at, I can query for the applications I, uh, which are, are uh, available within that collection, or if I want to have a look at uh, what applications are available across all my collections, I can query for the collections and then a for each and and run that through looking for each application. In this particular case, I want to have a look for everywhere where I've got the ISE published. So I want to look for the ISE and on which collections it's available. So if I just run this through, I should get it on one collection. And the reason I put it out into a format list is I wanted to show you the attributes which are returned or, or uh, the properties. So in this example, I've queried all my collections for a particular uh, application and I've output where the application appears. The problem is that it hasn't shown me which collection the application is, is uh, published in. So I could work that out on my own. Um, I would need to make this line a little bit more complex, which uh, for people who, who are kind of new to this is uh, 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 maybe not as intuitive as it potentially could could be. So um, 
I wanted to point that out as well. So once we have all of our applications there, it's very easy to un unpublish applications as well. That is uh, automatable also. So on this one, I'm going to just uh, look for every application which is available for this collection and then go ahead and unpublish each app. I need to put in the collection name each each uh, time as well because where this doesn't contain a collection property I can't just pipe it into un, un, uh, unpublish as your remote app program. I actually need to tell it which collection I want to use as well so it's uh, a little bit it needs a little kind of playing around to kind of make it work. I guess kind of you can also I'm guessing have in terms of the unpublished command you could have the same application published multiple times in different collections right? Exactly yeah 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 okay yeah so if you've created like multiple collections where you've got one application um, published so you may have created a collection for kind of internal users a collection for contractors a collection uh, for VIPs they may have one one or two applications in common right so those applications are available within each collection and you may have a reason that you want to revoke that one application across every collection or you may want to know which which collections that the application appears in um, that's not something that's easy to do at the moment um, particularly not for people who who are new to this I think so So we can uh, automate the removal of of applications as well. So for the next part, I'll just um, I'll just make the ISE available again. So that's published out again now. So that should show me the ISE only. Yeah. So that's on its way up publishing. So. We can also assign users. Um, with the users that you want to assign, you would assign them by VPN. One of the things that is not available um, or not that I've obviously seen is how to assign a collection to a group. So if you go to uh, remote app user, there's no option for a group only for users so for me I think this means that you have to kind of manage every collection user by user rather than kind of assigning to to um, maybe a team or to a role and just letting um, uh, people kind of inherit it um, if so you I have to have some kind of command line in front, right, to basically pull that user attribute first and then just yeah. loop over each and every one. Yeah, so... It's, okay. You can't yeah. do it natively. Yeah, you would need to know what your user UPNs are, right? Hmm. Yeah, so... The thing about... Or what's uh, good about this as well is that you do have user types and you can have either org IDs which are accounts within your your internal org within um, as your AD or a Microsoft account so in my collection here once I add this you should see that I've got two account types assigned to my collection ah yeah this is another th thing I put in on purpose because I wanted to point this out so if you we were talking earlier on about the get help um, so there is 
a parameter for this commandlet called profile because it's here and if I were to do that it comes up here. If you go into the help and you're looking for the profile parameter it's not there. So and there's no example and there's no explanation of what that parameter actually is. So I must admit I've got no clue how to use it. So I'll take that out for my example. So if I add my user to my collection, um, you should see on my collection now that I have two accounts. One is a internal account and one is a Microsoft account. Um, and what's cool about this is if you when you add a user to a collection, if they're part of your internal organization, um, then the collection of, of applications that you're sharing with them is automatically approved. If you're sharing with an account that's outside of your organization, that account must consent to using the applications that you're sharing. Um, and I think that's kind of around security, um, which is a really, really good uh, measure to have. So if I log in with this uh, Microsoft account, which has a collection shared to me, I should be prompted, would I like to have these applications or not? If I tell it no, I'll just carry on into the app and use any other applications available to me. If I say yes, then it it will come up um, it will come up as applications which are are uh, uh, available and usable from within the app. And if I check on my users for that collection. I can see whether they have actually consented to using my applications or not. So internal users are automatic, users which are not within your org are not automatic. So if I accept this application to make it available to me and if I run it again, should show as I've now uh, may take a little time to come up, but yeah, I have actually uh, accepted consent and I'm using it. Okay. So there may be a little lag in information, but it comes up. So um, I want to just, before I move on, I want to just change the account that I was logged in with. Um, so I was on 15. And if you're trying to log in with these credentials, they'll only work for a certain period of time, probably until this live presentation's over. You'll be out of luck after that, so sorry. <clears throat> All right, so that's that logged in and prepared. So with users as well who are assigned to collections, the problem is the same as with looking at what applications are available across what collections. If I have a user account and I want to know like whether I have allocated them to multiple uh, collections or, or what, um, that's also quite hard to do. So if you query your collections and then um, you look for the users assigned to each collection name, um, in, this, in this case I'm looking for a one user in particular. Uh, the properties it comes out with, it will show me what I've actually consented to use, but it won't show me where. So I don't know which collection 
I've allocated a user to. I just know that they have a collection. So if I've got multiple, I then need to kind of manually hunt around looking at like, well, where are they? So if we move on to the next one, which is having a look at the information we can query about a user. So I've logged into this uh, remote app client with my user account and I can see all my applications. So an important thing to note here is that, where's my ISE? An important thing to note here is that a login to the client is not actually a login to the remote app service. Well, it, when you log into the client, you're authenticating against either your Microsoft account or against Azure AD. And you're then querying your applications which are available to you from, from remote app. You're not actually logging into a remote app application, which means that if you're looking for what is in use across a particular collection, you'll get no information back. And this is, is because even though my applications are here, I've not actually launched any application, right? So there's no, no information available about what I'm actually doing. So the important thing there is a realization that you've got no control over a user's remote app client. And I think this is because we kind of look at it as um, this is very much a, a BYOD kind of uh, technology, right? So you've got no, no control over the user's endpoint. You're just kind of making applications available to them. If I think back to when I used to work with Citrix many, many years ago, you could kind of see when a user had, had even connected, you could kind of force a log off, all of that. You can't manage that with Azure Remote App. So if a user's logged in and they see their applications are here, um, you can remove them from a collection and that will um, remove the applications when they refresh. If they have that application here though and they launch it, but you've removed them, um, I'm, I must admit I'm not actually sure whether that will work or not. Um, the theoretically it might because they've authenticated with Azure they have the collection on their list and the application available to them. So I'm not sure whether that authentication into the app would work or not. Um, it would be a point to try out, but uh, the point is um, when you realize you have no, collect no control over the end user agent, um, sometimes you need to work around that. I'm guessing too, like the, the paradigm's a little bit different here, right? I mean, in theory, especially with contractors or people authenticating with Microsoft <clears throat> accounts outside of your org, they might have collections from multiple organizations published to them, right? So Exactly right, yeah. That, that client is not specific to your organization. The, exactly. the collection yeah. is, but the client itself is a, is a more generic yeah, so we had um, we had a scenario where with the proof of concept we worked on, we were using users that never had their own accounts. Um, we we had we had a requirement that the accounts needed to be controlled as well. So rather than kind of issuing applications out to users' own accounts, we had to create an account within um, Azure AD 
and then assign that account to a user for temporary usage, um, which means that we we needed to be able to force them to log out at a certain point as well, and we couldn't. So um, that was a problem for us. If you are using accounts which which uh, the user actually owns, then it's not so much of of a problem. If you're looking at a scenario where you do need end-to-end -end control over their whole environment, then then this is not a limitation because it's not. It it's working the way that it's meant to work. It's a scenario you need to be aware of. I, I guess. Yeah. So um, if we when we launch an application, however, though we can collect um, some information about what's used and what is uh, what is happening, but it's quite limited as well, and that that kind of caused us a problem also. So. Um, Now that I've got the application open, if I run a query for what the sessions are for my collection, I'll see that I've got a session open. And it actually shows me when I've logged on in kind of universal time that I'm connected and who I am. Um, but that's really all I get. So one of the issues that we ran into, I keep on calling these issues and things, and um, and I'll point out as well, it's it's not so much that they're problems, it's that um, for the particular project I worked on and and uh, and uh, the use case they had and the requirements they had as well, it was a little ahead of where this is as a technology at the moment. Um, so it's it's not that it's kind of bad, it's that we just had to work around a few things. Um, so one of which is we had a requirement to be able to know when a user was using an application, when they weren't uh, using it, and kind of if they had logged on and kind of walked away for half an hour, then we had to log them off so another person could use the account. Um, that information isn't available. It will only tell you whether they are connected, not connected, or disconnected. Um, I forget what the, the difference is between disconnected and not uh, connected. If I recall correctly, it's um, if you close the application in such a way that you've not actually exited it, you'll come up as as uh, disconnected. But there's no timeout. So once I have an application open, it's open. I'm connected even if I'm not using it. There's no... Uh, usage information around it. Um, there's no idle time either, so I can't, I can't actually tell. Okay, a user's opened an application. They've had it open for half an hour. They've not used it. I can act on that. Um, so at the moment, the information is very limited, and also the time comes up always in. Uh, in uh, universal time, which helps you quite a lot actually, because uh, uh, you do know uh, the time all the time. It isn't kind of like uh, you never need to kind of take into account time zones and things. 
except when you want to compare it to how long they have kind of been connected for. And if you're querying that on your on your own machine, which is in another time zone, you'll get um, a local time, right? So then you'll need to do some kind of com um, uh, conversion and and compare. It's not uh, that hard to do, but uh, you need to know uh, that you need to do it, basically. Um, so I'll talk a little more about that after I reach the end of the demo, which I'm nearly to the end of now. So um, for this one as well, once you've got connected users, obviously, in the portal, you'll be able to do certain things to them, uh, with them. Uh, the normal kind of log off, disconnect, and send a message. Uh, again, all of that is automatable as well. So if you've got um, users using applications and you need to kick them off for whatever reason or you need to kind of send them a message, then that's uh, pretty easy to do as well. So I should have a pop-up in a minute. Yeah, there we go. There you go. Yay. I am enjoying my app very much. Thank you. Okay, so uh, along that same line, there's um, there's a disconnect to user. So that will actually force them to need to reconnect from their app. Um, and there's the log off users as well. Um, so for this, I can query everyone who's kind of logged on to my particular uh, a collection, and then I can invoke a log off for them uh, based on UPN. So I've got my remote app ISE open here. If I run a forced log off, <clears throat> we'll ask you to confirm. And there's an acknowledgement of every operation that's happened. Today it's actually worked. I was playing around with this last night in preparation and it hadn't logged me off even though I tried to run that same command multiple times. So I've seen some hit with that. Um, I guess that's for awareness as well. Uh, you can force a log off, and then you can, of course, monitor for uh, who's actually logged on. But mm -hmm. sometimes it, it is a little bit hit and miss as well. So just kind of be aware of it, I think. Yeah. So, um, yeah. So I talked about this already. Um, I'll just touch on it again. So this is where we ran into some challenges on our project. It, it wasn't so much a problem with the remote app product. Um, not at all. It was uh, the requirements that we had at the time for the organization that we were working with were quite a lot more advanced than what uh, what uh, remote app is capable of at the moment. So I mentioned these really are the only three properties available to us right now. Um, they had some, some quite creative requirements around management. Um, so they we're working with a limited number of licenses and a limited number of accounts which which they needed to reuse uh, because uh, uh, they needed to control the licenses that they had and also maintain a tight control over over who could actually log into the collections and when and and uh, all of that. So um, 
where we had to reuse accounts, when we issued accounts out to people, they had a kind of a life time. So uh, things like when you had an account issued to you, um, you, you needed to log into the account within a certain um, uh, amount of time. Otherwise, we needed to recreate and reallocate the account elsewhere. Um, if you were logged into the account and using applications, you could only use it for a certain time because otherwise um, you could end up logging into the account, leaving it open for, for a couple of days. Other people could not then use the, uh, the application. If users were logged in, not using it, we needed uh, uh, to kick them out. If they were using it, they had a time limit. At the end of uh, the time limit, if they were using um, uh, the account, they could have another half an hour with it. And, uh, and a warning, look, uh, you've reached the end of your allocated time. Here's another half an hour. Um, and hurry up kind of thing. If they reached the end of that, it was another half hour with a look, you really need to hurry up now, other people need to use the account. If you reach the end of your time and your added hour, um, uh, you're cut off. Um, and if the account uh, had logged in and then it logged out, so if you had kind of logged in and used an application and then logged out before your maximum time elapsed, rather than, rather than letting the maximum time elapse, we wanted to reuse the account quicker, so we needed to know when that had happened. And, and in this uh, particular scenario as well, we needed to be actually uh, deleting and recreating accounts. And that was to make sure that if a user who had used an account had left any data in their remote app image profile, that no one else would, would be able to get to that. So we had to be... Um, uh, actually recreating accounts and tracking all of that information, which is a little ahead of what remote app can actually do at the moment. So we had to come up with a pretty kind of clever workaround for it, which included using an, an S, SQL as your database, where uh, we would uh, periodically run a script using a lot of these uh, uh, commandlets here to kind of track who was logged on and when. We would capture their log on time. Are they logged on now? If they're not logged in now, um, uh, capture the time and then track against that. And we actually wound up uh, uh, coming up with some really, really complicated and clever logic, but it worked, which was <laughs> really good. And it's actually working now as well. So it is in a production proof of concept, and it's working now. It's um, uh, uh, We're using a lot of the, uh, the commands here, but we had a problem as well in that um, we, we needed to run this script periodically, literally every few minutes. And the problem that we had was where could we run it from? So we tried using uh, um, Azure Automation, which at the time wasn't an option for us because the module that we were using was internal and pre-release. Uh, pre we could have uploaded it, 
but the commandlet that authenticated you against Azure needed a local certificate from the computer you were on, which with Azure automation, that's not the, uh, uh, the case. So we couldn't actually authenticate against uh, uh, Azure. So we then tried including it into the remote app image and running it as a scheduled task. We had some problems with that as well. That was a little hit and miss. Uh, we couldn't entirely work out why. So the way we ended up uh, doing it is, is uh, creating a VM and running it from within a VM. So, so we had a, a VM uh, uh, dedicated just to run in this. So that has now actually gone away. Now that it's a released module and there's a web jobs SDK as well, um, we can automate it without the, uh, the VM, but that's how we needed to work around it at, at the time. And uh, the logic we wound up with for session management wound up looking something like this. So there was a lot of information we, we needed to track around user accounts and, and uh, where they logged on, logged off. Um, in the end, it, it actually wound up looking pretty hairy. So. But we did it. So. And the only way we could have achieved that was luckily we had a kind of internal pre-release version of the um, of the commandlets. So, with that, that pretty much wraps up everything I wanted to talk about. So, um, there's a lot of automation available for us already uh, with Azure. Um, I would like to see a little bit more in terms of improvement around the help. That, that uh, for me, is really a key, a key area to, uh, uh, to look at. And as well around the information which is output from a number of these, uh, these uh, uh, commands. I would imagine over time, it will improve anyway. I mean, this is this is a technology which is uh, is uh, very new, I guess. So it's it's uh, pretty young. It's it's coming up. So uh, over time, I'm sure those improvements are going to be made. Um, as your remote app actually has some some really good use cases as well. So I would encourage you to have a look at it and there's a wealth of information out there on um, on the various Azure uh, uh, documentation libraries as well. And hopefully that is enough of an overview to encourage you to go ahead and check it out. And that's me. Awesome. Thanks, Matt. Thank you. Oh, I'll just actually mention as well, um, I'll leave this up for a moment for the recording. Um, there's a few things um, we came across along the way. Uh, DSC actually works from within a, a remote app image. And it will survive a sysprep as well. So if you if you create and push a configuration and you sysprep the image, it will continue working when it comes up. So that's really, really cool. Um, a problem we ran into along the way as well, actually, is, and I'm not sure if it's a problem now, 
if you were to assign a user to a collection and then you were to delete the account, you would have a kind of empty line here with a red exclamation mark there and then you were no longer able to manage any users on this page and you couldn't remove the entry either. It the basically only became way we, orphaned and then you just got to start. Yeah, yeah, pretty much. The only way we could kind of work around that is that we had to talk directly to uh, to uh, the product team who could then remove it for us. So we ran into Probably that. Probably not I'm an sure. option available to everybody. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure it's not a problem anymore um, mm -hmm. now that it's, it's uh, a little more mature, but we ran into that. Um, and the other thing as well is that um, we kind of touched on this earlier on. It's like users will try to use an application on any device if you make it available to any device. So if you publish Word to a little kind of tiny handheld, people will actually try to use a full Office version of Word on that uh, on that device, and then they will complain to you how crap it is. Okay. So <laughs> can, can you can you in mind, we specify had device accessibility so you can say like I only want to publish this to like this kind of device? Um, you can't control that actually. No. So okay. So once it's out there, as long as it's got as long as it's got the remote app client yeah. available for it, um, you can't say, for example, I'm going to allow Windows and iOS, but I'm going to lock down um, Android. Android, for example. Exactly right. Um, okay. I'm just trying to work out whether EMS could potentially help you do that. I I guess not. I mean, I guess if you knew what a user was using, you could potentially have a collection for mm -hmm. each, each kind of platform type and then only share optimized applications for that on that collection. But there would be nothing that would prevent them logging in anywhere else and trying to use those applications. So you can kind of only, I guess, uh, you just need to set expectations. Yeah. I guess. Probably the detection mechanism should be on the app itself. You know, if it's like uh, it's stored on push out on a version that is most loaded on the Android tablet that is less than seven inch or what, you have some limitation on uh, using the full fledged Office or um, yeah. So you can use uh, some smaller scale application like calculator or PowerShell, that kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah, it's kind of kind of tricky, I guess, because mm -hmm. the whole point is to remove the link between it. But I guess if even with collection names, right? Like you could call it "Don't use this on your phone" collection. <laughs> 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 yeah, I guess there's there's always some element of expectation and, and user education, right? But yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. We just had, you know, um, I mentioned. Our use case originally was to make a web application available to people, right? So what you're then actually doing as well is if you're coding your, your web application for a, a proper version of Internet Explorer, so it is actually a, a uh, desktop version of Internet Explorer, and then you're making that available to a user uh, who is opening it on kind of of uh, a little iOS thing. Um, it it may not quite work entirely as well as it ought to. So I guess um, yeah, because the app's seeing the user agent as that desktop exactly. and that browser. It's not detecting as a mobile. Actually, that yeah. so that's interesting. So. Um, I didn't think of that. With with publishing that web application, they actually didn't publish the app itself. They published the browser. Yeah. Is yeah. that correct? With the URL. Okay. Yeah. 
yeah yeah that was sort of the home page came up yeah. basically automatically as the app okay yeah and then um, and then and then they had to lock a lot of it down as well like um, uh, they had to make sure the application contained no links that could take you elsewhere like um, yeah I don't know, uh, Twitter LinkedIn kind of thing uh, yeah. they had to turn off all the kind of menu bars, all of that kind of thing. So from a web design side as well, even though they were only coding it for one one particular platform, they needed to keep in mind that a user could be using anything. And yeah. so they had to kind of make it look friendly enough that it's usable on every platform as well. Yeah, it, so, it solved a bunch of development issues and then caused a bunch of other design issues, right, that they had to take into yeah. account. Yeah. Yeah. However, those were looked on as as kind of easier to handle than having a massive kind of testing overhead and kind of being limited by browser versions, all of that kind of thing. So. Yeah. So it's uh, you trade up, and then you kind of work out how to remove other problems which have kind of made their way in over time, um, and based on how you've actually um, had to write the application up until now. Yeah. But yeah, in in terms of kind of like, in terms of using this as a way to kind of share an early look at applications or projects you're working on, this is really good as well because it means, again, with your application prototypes, you only need to worry about one version or one one platform. You don't need to kind of worry about, well, what if a user tries my application on XP or this or that? Um, you you only need to worry about the one uh, uh, the one thing. And then, you know, when you're happy, people are actually using it, they like it, and it's worth uh, kind of continuing on with. Um, you can then worry about the rest later. So particularly around application um, or for application developers, this is a really, really good tool, I think. 